Today, and we're looking forward to the service. Good to see all of you bright and shiny and smiling, all that good stuff. And we're going to start right out this morning with the Palm Sunday story. Carolyn is going to come and read for us the version from the Gospel of Matthew, the Palm Sunday story. Carolyn? <clears throat> I'm reading from the 21st chapter of Matthew today, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed him them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join their hosannas by standing and singing together. Number 278, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. If you're able, I invite you to stand. <clears throat> Thank 
As the people of old praise Jesus as in Jerusalem, so we have gathered to praise Jesus too. Your Holy Spirit so we're today that our will always be loyal to Jesus. The one who fresh purpose for our days. Amen. You may be seated. Today we have two texts of scripture. Read the second one, taken and it's going to focus on the cross. So good to see you here today. Verses 17 through 25. For the message of the cross, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosophy of this age? Was not God made foolish? For since the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him of what was preached, those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and both the Jews and the Greeks. Christ is the power of God and with the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now with Power Pack today, Karen Ahievich. Welcome, Karen. Take your time. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Have you ever looked forward to a special occasion? And then when that day finally arrived, it just wasn't quite what you had expected? Well, that's what happened to the people in the story today. Some 2,000 years ago, during the time when Jesus was on earth, the people in Israel were living under the harsh rule of the great Roman Empire. The Jews had been taught for generations in their syn synagogues that someday someone would be sent by God to save them. They'd been waiting a long time for a king like the mighty David to conquer their enemies and return Israel to power and glory. Perhaps this Jesus that they'd been hearing so much about lately could be that savior that they were longing for. After all, he was becoming quite well known throughout the country because of his preaching and the many miracles he'd been performing. Jesus had turned water into wine. He healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, gave hearing to the deaf. He fed 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish. He taught people how to live godly lives. He even forgave sins. The most amazing miracle that the people heard about was that Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been in the grave for four days already and had started to stink. 
Who could do all these things unless they'd been sent by God? Could this Jesus be their long-awaited Savior? Naturally, people were eager to see this person. Well, one day word spread around Jerusalem that Jesus was on his way to town to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Passover. Crowds of people lined the dusty roads leading into the city so they could see this powerful person they hoped would be a new king and who would kick the Roman army out of the country. People may have thought that Jesus would be riding into town on a magnificent white horse, like the, a great conquering hero. But instead, he arrived on a lowly, borrowed donkey. It was not what they had expected, but they still were excited and they spread on the ground in front of Jesus their coats and branches from the palm trees and shouted with joy, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. You can imagine their shock and disappointment later that week when instead of what they had hoped for, and expected to happen, Jesus was betrayed by one of his own disciples, arrested by soldiers, abandoned by his friends, whipped, made fun of, put on trial, crowned with a crown of thorns, and then nailed to a cross like a common criminal. This was not the kind of savior that they had waited so long for. Fortunately for all of us, the story of Jesus does not end with his death. Three days after his crucifixion, Jesus rose from the dead on Easter morning. He was alive. His life, death, and resurrection had fulfilled all the promises given so many years before in the Bible. But wait, the story gets even better. Jesus promised forgiveness of sins and everlasting life in heaven for everyone. That means for you and for me, who repents and believes in him. The gift of eternal life was given for all of us, not because we deserve it or have earned it. Jesus paid the price for us with his death and resurrection. What a gift. Now join me in saying, Hosanna. Hosanna. Everybody, Hosanna. Hosanna. Even louder so can hear it outside. Hosanna. Hosanna. <laughs> Wasn't that great? And that was uh, anticipating, too, the theme of next week's message, which is going to focus on eternal life. So that was awesome. And, uh, and also paved the way for the message this morning, too, by the way. Uh, Karen, great job. Now, before we go any further, <clears throat> we want to celebrate with those palms. And so I'm going to ask the children here, uh, Sage and Tristan and Ryan and Soren, and you can help too if you want, Reagan. The palms are right up here on the very front seat. If you guys would come and get them and make sure everybody gets one of these things uh, right now, that would be great. They're right up here. Just grab a handful and make sure everybody gets some. There's some on the other side too. Somebody's got to do this side over here. Well, leave. There you go. Reagan, you can give me a couple here, please. Got a couple for me, Reagan? Thanks. Ah, thanks. You're gonna have to go get some from your brother. He's got a whole bunch. <laughs> there you go.
Yeah, Joanne needs one too, Sage. One of you can climb up and give one to Linda upstairs. And just put the extras back on the front seat. We'll be good. All right, just save one for yourself. Yeah, save one for yourself. All right, now I'm gonna ask you to stand again and we're gonna sing the chorus, Hosanna, and wave them, okay? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, To the King of Kings, glory, glory, glory to the King of Kings. Lord, we lift up Your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O oh Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O oh Lord, my God. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> there are always some who are talented enough to turn these into crosses by folding them up. I'm never talented enough to do it. But... All right, let's go to prayer together. Let's spend a few moments in meditation and prayer as Joanne plays for us. Great and merciful Father, in the worst of days and in the best of days, you are God. 
thank you that you do not change and your sovereign rule endures forever. We come to you this morning with troubled hearts at all the news this past week of yet another school shooting in our country. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. Please comfort those who grieve this morning, oh Lord. We cannot imagine their sudden sorrow. And please grant to all of us compassion for those who are depressed. Cause us as a nation to fear the one who can throw body and soul into hell, as Jesus warned us. Please give our leaders wisdom as to what can and should be done. And beyond that, Lord, help us to seek your ways in your heart that we can bring the message of true healing and reconciliation that our world so badly needs. Lord, we pray for our country in this time of political and international tension. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. Protect us from internal tensions that would divide and from enemies without that would destroy. Most of all, protect us from our spiritual enemies who dresses his overtures as light and love when in fact he is sowing lies for our confusion, just as he did in Eden. In this holy week, may we be able to fix our thoughts on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. May we remember his sufferings for us that bring us peace. As we obey again this morning his command for us to remember him with grape juice and bread, May thoughts of his death on the cross for our sake linger in our minds all week and be used of the Spirit to urge us on to holiness of character and holy service to others. Father, we pray for those in special need today. We continue to pray for Susan's son-in-law, uh, Susan's son's mother-in-law, uh, Linda Allen, who has cancer. Please calm her fears and grant her your peace. Please, may she have excellent doctors who advise her well on treatments. And by your grace, may the treatments chosen be effective because your healing hand is at work on her behalf. We continue our prayers for Karen Ahievich's brother-in-law, Jack, and we also pray for his wife, Don, Karen's sister. Lord, both of them need a healing touch from you. They need that ability to persevere and not grow weary, to walk with God through the valley and not faint an ability that will come only from the Holy Spirit's aid. May the God who gives hope and encouragement be their physician in this time. And Lord, there are others on our hearts today. You know the ones that each one is praying for today in these moments. Pray for those who are traveling, Lord, that they may have safe travels where they are headed. Thank you, Lord. Please hear our prayers now as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's always difficult to decide what to preach about on Palm Sunday because while Palm Sunday story is an obvious choice, Palm Sunday is also the first day of Holy Week and the most logical time to talk about the cross of Jesus. And so that's what I've chosen to do this morning. The text I've chosen is 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 18. Glad for the children to be able to go out today. And thank you to those who are volunteering to help them. love children. 
They keep us inspired. Amen. That wasn't very loud. They keep us inspired, right? Amen. Amen. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> and plus, we keep laughing too, right? That's right. Hey, I need help up here. That's a good idea. <laughs> All right. The text is, the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, this verse immediately presents a challenge, because how can the cross, which we consider so beautiful, which we use to decorate our, our walls, which we, we uh, put on ourselves for decorations, you know, either as necklaces or ladies on your ears, you know, why, why can something we consider so beautiful be considered foolishness? So we have to investigate that. Well, to the Jewish people, um, they, as Karen explained it so well, they were looking for a victorious Messiah, as Karen said, one who would reestablish David's reign. And the idea that this Messiah should be crucified and not and, and crucifixion, as Karen pointed out so well, was the death of a criminal. It was the death of a slave. You, you were not allowed to be crucified if you were a Roman citizen. You had to have a more sophisticated punishment of decapitation. <laughs> not that you were any less dead, but <laughs> it, it was a torturous punishment reserved for the lowest of society. And the idea that the Messiah would suffer that, well, it was not only foolish, it was actually offensive to Jewish people. And as the Bible says, the Jews like miraculous signs, and the cross did not look like a sign at all, even though it was to those of us who understood. It was instead ugly and repulsive. Now to the Greeks, the Greeks glorified philosophy. Their heroes were people like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. And the philosophers of Greece thought of God as detached from this world, untouched by both suffering and death. And Greeks valued cunning words. The Athenians, Paul tells us, they love to talk, talk, talk about all kinds of ideas. To think that someone who would be the Messiah would be exalted through dying rather than through reasoning, that was foolishness to them. Today, some people consider it foolish too. Younger people in our culture are, are not acquainted with Roman and Greek times and at the times when there was so little justice and so much violence against commonplace people. They're also not familiar with the Old Testament Jewish background, which helps us so much to understand the cross and its meaning. And even today, some people worry that with the cross as a symbol, we might encourage people to be victims, which we don't. So even today, some people might consider this foolishness, which it's not. It is instead a demonstration of God's wisdom. How is that? First of all, a dying savior was the full realization of the miracle of incarnation, which started at Christmas. We celebrate at Christmas how Jesus came to be one of us. Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, just like we are. Could we have said that if he had never faced death? which is one of the greatest and worst sort of things that we ever face? No, it could not have been said. But Jesus was made like us in every way, even unto an unjust and tortuous death. So Hebrews goes on to say, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, in their vulnerability, so to speak. He shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Thank God that he has freed us from that. So the cross is essential to God's purposes in the incarnation. 
it completes it. In addition, only a cross could expose the real depravity of the human heart and the real cost of our sin. A few years ago, I read a book about the cross um, that said, the value of the cross is directly proportionate to my awareness of my own sin. Sort of like Jesus in the parable that he gave, he talked about two debtors, and both of their debts were forgiven. And one had owed a lot of money, and the uh, other one had owed a little money. Neither could pay, and so the one to whom they were owed the money forgave them both. And Jesus asked his listeners, now which one will love him the most? And the people said, well, the one who was forgiven the most. And Jesus said, yeah, you're right. When we realize how much we have been forgiven, our love increases. Our appreciation for the cross increases. We need to see the cross of Jesus as a measure of how offensive our sin is to God. Only a depraved race could have crucified the Son of God as a criminal. Only those who have the ability to believe a lie, only those who have, can put their own power above the welfare of others, only such as are unwittingly under the enemy, enemy's influence could do such a thing. Yet we did it. And in so doing, we indicted ourselves in our own fallenness. And so we can raise no objection when the Bible says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet, thanks be to God, the message of the cross contains another message. According to the Bible, it is also a message of God's love for us. And we get to that in a simple way. We ask, why in the world did God do this? And we discover that the dying Lamb of God was the ultimate sign of God's love. Paul wrote, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, only someone who loves very much will sacrifice for someone else at all. But God made the ultimate sacrifice for us by sending his son to do the things that he did, including Calvary. Now, many of us remember the uh, Paul, the, the verse that we learned in childhood. For God so loved the world that he gave his one, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So when we see a cross, we remember how much God loves us. See, Jesus made an implement of death into a reminder of the love of God. And so when you see a cross like this, you are more likely to think about it as a reminder that God loves you because Jesus loves you because Jesus died for you. That's part of the wonder of the cross. We also see the wisdom of God because only the shedding of Christ's blood was a was a sufficient uh, sacrifice and a sufficient atonement for sin. If Jesus had only been a good moral teacher, it would not have been enough. If Jesus had only been a strong, beneficent political leader, it would not have been enough. Even if he had just been a miracle working healer. It would have been inadequate to bring us salvation. But in dying for us, as Jesus did, it was enough. So the Bible says, such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, Unlike the other priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day by day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed 
their, for their sins once for all when he offered himself. You see, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God has been teaching us the principle that Paul expressed in Romans. The wages of sin is death. And because this is so, the Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, the symbol of life, there is no forgiveness. The Jewish sacrificial system went to great lengths in atoning for sins through sacrificial deaths of animals. But a better way was needed, and the cross of Jesus provided the better way. As Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean sanctified them so that they were outwardly clean. But how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? so that we may serve the living God. Only the wisdom of God could have devised a plan that was at once the ultimate in incarnation, the ultimate demonstration of the love of God, and the sufficient atonement for human sin. No wonder, Paul exclaims, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Amen? You see, now we can begin to understand why the message of the cross is the power of God to salvation. Because on the cross, Jesus shed his blood to establish the new covenant, which we celebrate each month when we have communion, as we will do just later this morning. The old covenant was created through the sacrifice of lambs at the original Passover as the Israelites left Egypt, and through the sacrifice of bulls and goats at Mount Sinai. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, shed his blood for us on Passover to establish a new covenant. The night before he was uh, celebrating the uh, Passover with, meal with his disciples, and Luke records this. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The message of the cross is also the power of God for salvation. Because through Jesus' work on the cross, we are set free from sin. Passover was all about freedom. Each year, still today, those of Jewish faith celebrate Passover. And they, re they remember how Moses led their nation out of Egypt toward freedom in the promised land. Jesus leads us into freedom too. Freedom from slavery to sin. Paul wrote about us, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. But actually, the situation is even more awesome than that. For in the cross and resurrection, Jesus triumphed over spiritual enemies, his and ours. That which seemed like a defeat, Jesus turned into victory. Why do we decorate our walls with a cross, an instrument of torture? Because Jesus turned it into a sign of victory. We can not only celebrate his triumph, as we will next Sunday, but we look for his triumph to have implications in our lives every day. When we study the cross, we discover that Jesus looked past the cruelty of humankind and took on bigger enemies, death itself, and Satan, the father of lies and the enemy of our souls. And Jesus' cross was the beginning of a huge triumph. In the words of the psalm that Jesus began to quote on the cross, Psalm 22, You who fear the Lord, praise him, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, 
and all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. That's us. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Hallelujah. You see, what appeared to be ultimate defeat became ultimate triumph. Hallelujah. I close today with a very interesting uh, piece of prose poetry. A few years ago, many years ago, I guess, I don't know what the date of it is. Um, oh, in the 70s, okay, that's how old it is. The, a pastor by the name of Calvin Miller wrote a trilogy and the trilogy is an interesting trilogy. It's a metaphor and a poetical retelling. And this one is the gospel story. The second one is the book of Acts and the third one is the book of Revelation. Uh, this is the best of the three, in my opinion. I've read all three of them. Uh, and they're, but they're well worth reading. The way that he tells, retells the gospel in this is awesome. Some of the people you will recognize. I'm not going to read the whole thing, obviously. But I'm going to read just a little bit of it because I want you to catch the notes of victory and the notes of, of re renewal that are in here. The story that I'm going to pick up the story on the morning after uh, the morning of the resurrection um, or the morning, this, this, this part comes right after the crucifixion has happened. It's like on the Saturday in between. The sentinels returned the madman to the grove. He followed them without a struggle. He walked along in the stupefaction of his disbelief. In his former madness, he would have crushed the wardens in the foment of his rage. He could scarcely understand that in a single day he had been granted both a new mind and an injured heart. The day's proceedings had been too much for him. Every time he closed his eyes, he saw the mallet of the executioner again, the splintering of tendons, the wincing of the singer, the facial blows the priest had given him. All these made his mind a horror chamber. Somewhere in his reverie of agony, he reached the wall. The attendants locked him in the irons while he stared vacantly away. They brought him bread and water, which he never saw. He only wept. A tremor shook his giant frame. The darkness came. The madman cried. While somewhere higher on the wall, the singer died. It was good the madman could not behold the suffering. He could not have borne it. A trinity of other lovers came, all three absorbed in one great hurt. The little girl sat down between the older women. I am his mother, said the oldest. I am the demonstration of his power, said the little girl. I am only a friend, said the other woman. I gave him life, said his mother. I gave him twisted feet, said the little girl. I gave him shame, said the friend. He taught me obedience to the father spirit, said the mother. He taught me re running. He taught me love. They sat beneath the great machine of death. It was a troubled pieta of stone, yet it still wept. I feel very old today, said the mother. as She placed her arm around the shoulder of the little girl. I feel as though I soon must watch the father spirit die. The girl sobbed into the bosom of the singer's mother. The friendship seller was a world away. She said, I'm ashamed of being human. It is the very shame I felt the first time that I, she could not bring herself to tell her ugly fall before the grieving child. The moment I saw the keeper of the ancient ways, who was the chief accuser, I knew he bore some vague familiarity. He is no priest. I know, the older woman said. He was the piper who taught me a song of death and called it love, the friendship seller said. 
I knew him too, said the little girl. He used to pass where I begged and looked upon my twisted legs and laughed. I used to feel so bad when he would look and smirk in satisfaction. And every time he passed, he left me crying. They ceased their talking and looked up at the wall. The great machine hung heaviness into their souls. The giant timbers creaked in the ordeal they were asked to undergo. The women shuddered when they viewed the suffering form that lay among the cables and the gears. Grief owned the day. In turn, the three stood up and stared upon the dying singer, high and lifted up. My joy, my help, said the little girl. My life, said the friendship seller. The night stood dumb. The burdened mother wept. The ancient star song lost. The world hater won. I wish I might have died instead of you, my son, my son, my son. Now we're skip over. This is early Easter morning. We're awful glad the story doesn't stop there, right? The child lay wide awake and filled with fear. Something dreadful in the dying of her friend left her trembling in the cold. To be an orphan in a world that took so little thought of homeless children was tenuous enough. But greater dread stalked her smaller world. The singer was no more, and she felt again the way she had before he came and found her begging at the roadside. Please keep me well, she prayed. Father Spirit, keep me as the singer left me. She felt her little legs to be quite sure they had not withered in the night. Now that he is gone, please, Father Spirit, she pled into the darkness, must I become an invalid again? In every shadow of the night, she saw the lurking image of the world hater, and she remembered how he leered at her and smirked to see her in the roadside dust. Oh, Father, it is better that I had not received the gift of motion than to have gained and lost it. I can never go back again to crawling in the streets, she sobbed. Please do not make me crawl again and beg. Oh, Father, please. The first faint coloring of dawn found her lying in fatigue, still begging for her legs, which had not suffered any loss for all her worry. But her agony and doubt had caused her view of things to grow narrow in the night. That's probably happened to us a few times too, huh? Even the first pale light of day did not reveal the world that really was. She felt someone beside her on the simple mat that was her bed. You worried about your legs for nothing, said a voice. She sat upright in her fear. But in a moment, she was on her feet and seemed about to run. Then she looked at him more carefully. Her heart was pumping. Can it be? And she concluded in her madness, it is. And she threw herself into the singer's arms with such a strong embrace it all but knocked him over. You're alive, alive. She closed her eyes and opened them to be sure that blinking would not erase her joy. Oh, singer, I was so afraid. I thought my legs would be as yours are far better than mine this morning, he said. His hands and feet were barely recognizable. She who cried for her own legs was overcome by real concern for his. Will you heal mine, she said. Heal yours, your own. Please, singer, make them well. Oh, they are well. There's no pain now. But they're scarred and wounded. How can they be well? Earthmaker leaves the scars, for they preserve the memory of pain. He will leave my hands this way so men will not forget what it costs to be a singer in a theater of hate. But the word, the word they wrote on your face is gone. The singer reached up to his forehead where the searing iron had left the accusation of the council. The word was gone indeed. It is, he said, because Earthmaker cannot bear a lie. He could not let me wear the word for he is truth. He knows no contradiction in himself. So learn this, my little friend. No man can burn a label into flesh and make it stay when heaven disagrees. A lot of us need to apply that to our own souls. No man can burn a label into flesh and make it stay when heaven disagrees. But the Father Spirit, but did the Father Spirit agree with all the other things they did to your hands and feet? He wished they had not done it, but yes, he did agree that without these wounds, Tara could not know how much 
he loved her. You will find, my child, that love rarely ever reaches out to say, except it does it with a broken hand. She seemed to understand that because he loved her childish eyes so much, he made her ready for the future. Do you love me, child? He asked. With all my heart, she answered. And would you give me anything I ask of you? He said. Anything, she answered. Well, it may be hard to give me all I ask. Not long ago, in the name of love, I gave you legs. Yesterday, that very love demanded mine. But the song is all that matters. It may be you will have to sing it where the crowd will shout you down and demand your legs or life. But it would be far better to give them both than to surrender up the music in your soul. Some will hate you for the song you love. They will seek to stop your singing. But no matter how they treat you, remember that I have suffered everything before you. If they should brand you with a name across your face, she interrupted him. It cannot stay if heaven disagrees. She finished his statement. She had stretched her small philosophy, but he knew that she was growing in her understanding of the song. Let us stop her talking and say that for right now, it's enough to be a little girl with two good legs and, and know the sun is shining. Let's go out in the fields together. Are you afraid to hold my wounded hand? He asked. It's so ugly. It's so beautiful, she disagreed. He held out his gentle hand, and she placed her little hand in his and was surprised to find that when his hand had closed around hers, he had a healthy grip. Your hand is firm and strong. God did not leave it broken long, she said. He never does, she answered. Hand in hand, they walked, and the sunlight brought the richest day, the brightest day the world has ever known. She held his hand as if to never let him go. She skipped at the base of her shadow and danced the way she had the very day they met. I'm sorry I had doubts about my legs, she said, and then asked, where are we going? To a man who has some doubts about his mind. Amen. The cross. The message of the cross. The wisdom of God. And the power of God. For salvation. Amen. I invite you to stand with me. And we'll sing a song of celebration. Awesome is the Lord most high. Oh, Lamb of God. Sorry, long, wrong one. I'm glad I've got her to help me get on the right page. Lamb of God.
Your blood poured out my sin erased. It was my death you died. I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. There is no greater God. There is no greater God. The Savior lifted up. There is no greater God. The Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin. Because my death, your life, I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. Maybe she did. <clears throat> Well, it's time for communion. Those sharing communion at home, remember that God can extend the pastor's blessing of the elements here in the sanctuary to include the communion elements in your home and to bless your obedience to Christ's command to remember him. And for all of us, wherever we are, it's essential that we prepare our hearts and have an attitude of reverent receptivity to the grace of God as we partake. Let's begin by confessing our sins together according to the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God, our Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified died and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the word Catholic there means a universal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God in silent prayer as to end plays for us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let us give thanks for God's presence with us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Hear now the words by which our Lord instituted this remembrance, as recorded by Paul. Let us remember together our Lord Jesus, who in the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had broken it, 
when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said to them, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith which is Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Now, Father, as we humbly come before you, offering simple elements representing the grape juice and bread which Jesus used at the Last Supper, we pray that you would fill our hearts with your spirit, both those gathered here and those participating online. Bless also the elements we present to remember Jesus, that they may be for us as the body and blood of Christ, so that we can be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Together we are one body in Christ because of his one sacrifice for us. May we be united in doing the work of Jesus in this world until he comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now if uh, Lori and Lisa would come and serve as communion ushers today, please. Bread is gluten free. And then here at Community Wesleyan, we would go ahead. We, you do not have to be a member. We only ask that you be a Christian and you're welcome to take with us. body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you, preserve your soul and body into everlasting life. Take and eat this remember that Christ's body was broken for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Shall we partake together? Ushers, please return.
Oh Lord, we are so thankful for what you've done for us. We give praise and honor to Jesus. For it is nothing but the blood of Jesus that can wash away our sins, that can make us white as snow, as the Bible says. Thank you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is shed for you, preserve your soul and body into everlasting life. Take and drink this and remember that Christ's blood was shed for you. And we thank you. Shall we take together? Ushers, please return. Now I invite you, oh, let's pray together first. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. We are unworthy children, and we are clay in the potter's hand. Our lives are but a breath. Yet we are of great worth because we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, a price of inestimable worth. So we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Now we are yours. Sons and daughters of God, citizens of the heavenly kingdom, and heirs of eternal riches. Our new elevated station is hard to conceive, and we are humbled whenever we remember what Jesus has done for us. Help us always to live lives worthy of the calling we have received while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious reappearing of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. I invite you to stand and we'll sing together. Awesome is the Lord Most High. Great are you, Lord, mighty in strength. You are faithful. And you will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory we offer everything. Raise your hands, all you nations. Shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord Most High. Where you send us, Lord, we will go. You're the answer we want the world to know. We will trust you. When you call our name, where you lead us, we'll follow all the way. Raise your hands, all you nations, shout to God, our creation. How awesome is the Lord most high. We will praise you together for now and forever. How awesome is the Lord most high. Alleluia. 
Hallelujah, Hallelujah. How awesome is the Lord Most High. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. How awesome is the Lord Most High. Praise the people, tell to God all creation. How awesome is the Lord most high. We will praise you together, oh now and forever. How awesome is the Lord most high. Raise your hands, all you nations, shout to God of creation. How awesome is the Lord most high. To forever, and now and forever. How awesome is the Lord most high. Maybe be suited. Amen. Maybe be seated. All right. Today, during greeting time, we will have youth connection time in the fellowship hall. And we have a video on the crucifixion and the resurrection uh, done by the Bible Project. So I know you really enjoy <laughs> that one. <laughs> All right. Um, connection groups uh, only on Tuesday this week thursday and saturday groups will not meet not meet this week so next week being easter and we have our egg hunt for the younger people so if you did bring candy today uh this is the last day obviously and then if you could give it to carol uh, griffin and she and her family will be packing the eggs this week for next sunday all right, and remember, only one more week for that uh, Parsons landline. It will quit working on April 10th, and you will need to use your uh, 315 numbers for Joanne and I in order to reach us. We didn't need three numbers. <laughs> Birthdays this week. Ian has a birthday this week. So happy birthday, Happy Ian. birthday, Ian. Hey. And also, Luke has a birthday. Happy birthday, Luke. The sixth. <laughs> uh, so coming up this week, we have a special Good Friday service at 7 p.m. And then Easter, we have uh, the Acon and coffee hour. So if you want to remember to bring something special for the adult coffee hour. Then coming up this uh, month. Also tell them what's going on in the Easter service. We have choir. Oh, yes. And we have special music in the Easter yes. service. So it's going to be a special time together to praise God for Easter season. Oh, I almost forgot. We have little cards, invitation cards that you can give to your friends with the time of the service and the egg hunt. And these are up on the piano. So uh, if you have someone you want to invite, grab one of these cards. If anyone yeah. wants to be bringing flowers to help in decorating the sanctuary, we always appreciate that. Yes. Also, this month we have the tag sale drop off on the 15th and the tags and bake sale on the 29th. So, be getting your things together for that. And you can say a prayer for me and, and others who, who need to go. Uh, also, we discovered that on the 29th, our local district, the Connecticut district, is having a conference that afternoon at noon to three o'clock in West Hartford. We have a special speaker on evangelism. So, if, you're, if you don't have to be at tag sale that day, I would encourage some of you to go with me or, or drive yourself into West Hartford to attend the, the conference and hear the special speaker on evangelism. Thank you also for your financial generosity to our church. Your generosity helps make our weekly services possible. You know, the heat and the lights and the organization behind the scenes don't happen by themselves and your contributions help make them happen. So 
You can continue to help us by giving a recurring gift or a one-time gift using the donate button on our website, or you can text your gift to 860-579-6338, or you can place your gift in the giving box in the rear or mail it to box 422 East Granby, Connecticut, 06026. Let's give thanks to God for the gifts of God's people. Heavenly Father, your every good and perfect gift comes down from you. Thank you. Thank you also for every faithful steward who has contributed time or finances to your work this week. It takes so many people in order for your, the work of your house to continue. Please guide our church in using the tithes and offerings of God's people. And please bless each giver with your divine supply. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I invite you now to pray our closing prayer together with me. Oh God, thank you that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross. Please help us to die to sins and live for righteousness for Jesus' sake and ours. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>